Good morning, guys. It's Saturday. And I wanted to talk about a couple things that have been on my mind from a lot of my friends in tradition. So I've seen this, I've experienced this um, a lot when mostly people from the Western world would go into um, different traditions, whether it be Haitian voodoo, African voodoo, Palo, Santeria, um, Condomble, um, Ichefefa, African voodoo etc. Um, we tend to be um, a little detached from the process sometimes. Um, and then when people get on us about um, learning languages, um, following along with the ceremony, you get kind of pushed back. And here's the premise of that. So, and here's what can happen. So, when you do a sacrifice, whether it's for a Lawa, Nkisi, Vodun, Arisha, um, there's usually an animal involved. And even if it's food, um, if you're preparing food, um, the whole act of preparing the food, you're preparing fresh food, you're cooking it, you're putting your energy into that so that um, you're giving that sacrifice to that spirit and it's supposed to mean something. It's supposed to be a sacrifice of time, energy, and of course, money um, for materials, and then you're placing that out so that either your ancestors or that spirit can take that energy. Um, with animal sacrifice, um, that's that's a life, that's a life of an animal that um, you have to, a lot of people don't even like doing animal sacrifice, it is, or if they don't like to do it and they're just completely detached, and here's why you can't do that, because um, a, it's respect for the animal's life that is giving towards the betterment of you. And B, um, just that connection between um, nature and the natural flow of life. C, um, when you sacrifice an animal, you're supposed to talk to it. You're supposed to pray to it. You're supposed to pray to that ancestor, that spirit, so that there is a smooth transition of energy or um you're taking something away from you, um, and the animal's taken away for the betterment of you. So a lot of people, when they do sacrifice, whether they do it for other people or self, they it's kind of sometimes can be robotic. And then other times where I've seen a lot in, I mean, to be honest, quite in Haiti and um, Africa, this has happened to me where um, you're dealing with people who are a lot. Um, economically may be worse off shaped than you and you come as a foreigner or American or European or Latino or whatever and you're you're um, sacrificing bigger animals like cows goats sheep ram um, pigs etc and they normally wouldn't be able to afford it so not only would are they eating the sacrifice afterwards but sometimes you'll have some unethical people who will go and talk to that goat or talk to that cow or talk to that ram before you in their own language and you think they're doing some type of prayer and they're really praying for themselves they're praying for the life of that animal to be accepted by the risha so that or vodun or loire and so that the life of that um the energy of that sacrifice is their sacrifice instead of yours, even though you pay for it, even though um, <clears throat> you may or may not be there, that sacrifice is they're petitioning for themselves, not you. And therefore, even though it may go, blood may go on your shrine or may be on the um, altar and you think everything's the same, it's really not. I've even had it when it happened with me in African voodoo where somebody was um, talking to the goat before it was uh, given to Sakpata and Sakpata would not, it was for Ebo for me, so Sakpata would not accept it. The goat would not eat the herbs. Um, Sakpata wouldn't accept the goat. We had to actually get another goat, a fresh goat that no one talked to because one of the priests had talked in the ear of the goat asking for blessings for themselves and it was really for me. So this does happen, and um, just being detached or not being aware of what's going on can kind of be a waste of a sacrifice. And then you'll find out later, months later, or in your next 
key five reading, your Arisha or Vodun is asking for the same thing that you paid for and that you did. And you're like, what the hell? But that's what's really might have what happens because somebody else basically co-opted your sacrifice because you weren't paying attention. And you can't do that. You cannot be detached from something special when it's involving a life of an animal. You can't be um, just kind of mute to what's going on. And also a lot of, um, I think a lot of Americans, they get their sacrifices done by other people, um, either here and abroad, and they're not they're not aware of the whole any of the process. So basically, just because you have a picture of a dead animal doesn't mean your stuff was actually fed. Or even if it is, has blood on it, it doesn't mean that the energy of that animal went to the benefit or for the manifestation of something in your path. It might have just been just the blood on it, but um, it's being used for the betterment of other people. So you have to be aware of that. You have to um, just be a part of the process like you're supposed to be. Naturally, we're always supposed to be part of the process. So um, if something gets co-opted, it's really your fault because you want the luxury to be detached, the privilege to be detached. You want this fast food type of um, sacrifice where you don't want to know how things are killed. You don't want to see it. And that's the other thing. You cannot put fast food on ancestral altars. I've seen people in hoodoo groups do. You cannot put KFC just because your grandma like fried chicken. Um, you have to cook the chicken or somebody has to cook chicken if you don't know how to do it. So is you know, cakes, baked stuff is, is a little bit different, but um, it's best if you do it yourself, whether it's for your own ancestors, whether for um, your spirits, even if, you know, sometimes instead of, you know, like cassava, instead of getting the, you know, raw cassava, you can get cassava powder or you can get OG powder, which is the fermented corn, or you can get pounded yam. That's fine. But you're actually still cooking the, in the process and you're preparing stuff. I mean, you can take shortcuts, but that's don't, let's say, ta-da, I bought this from the store and here you go. Um, very few times that's not going to work. And I see a lot of the process done more in Brazil where people are spending lots of time with preparation, not just for Omiero bass and everything, but just the, a lot of the cooking, everything's done by hand. And it seems sometimes that's why, you know, other people, and also I see them also a lot of Latino and not and non-black culture people who go into these tr- traditions. They spend a lot of time. They spend a lot of time drawing veves and Haitian food. They spend a lot of time preparation for food. They have spent a lot of time in just a lot of the intricacies of the ceremony because they want to learn everything. And my black counterparts, they always say, "Why are they?" Um, in the tradition first thing, and then also why are they um, getting better results than them? It's because they are in the process. They're trying to learn as much as possible. Um, sometimes as black folks, we kind of have this feeling that uh, we are, you know, it's because we take it for advantage of just the ancestral links to things. And sometimes we don't have any ancestral links to things. And we still don't put the effort towards learning and being part of the process as we should. So um, with any tradition, there's nothing guaranteed. And there's even if you have an ancestral pool, the spirit's literally saying, you need to be in this tradition. Um, you have to put the work in. And sometimes it's a lot of work, especially if you're more of a solitary person where you're doing a lot of stuff by yourself. Um, even after initiation, it's a lot of work. So, or doing it for clients. So just be aware of that. So you get the most results when you actually put your, you sacrifice your time, your energy. And this is not just money. You can throw money at a lot of different things and it may never work. But, um, and then the other thing about sacrificing money, I see people burning money, which is like a more of a Chinese ancestral practice. African Americans never did that stuff. So it's a little weird because, um, it does work for some people. But with us, you know, most African-American and Caribbean cultures, we, we bartered stuff. Even indigenous culture, we bartered things. We bartered jewelry, we bartered bangles, we bartered cowrie shells, we bartered clothes. Um, before we got into the paper currency and the digital, now digital currency. And even when you're doing, let's say, you see a Babalao have money, 
a part of their abo, that money is used to buy something. It's not you're just burning money and wasting it. You are um, using it for a purpose for something that the the Arisha or the Vodun want needs and wants. You're buying palm oil. You're buying gin. You're buying palm wine. You're buying you know toasted corn. More produce like pound, yams, um, for pound of yam, um, all types of things, just or cola nuts. Um, you're using it to buy something. You're not just burning it and then saying, oh, you have the energy or the money and you take it. That's not really how our spirits work. Um, so, yeah. Just want to talk about that because I was getting a little argument in the hoodoo group about <laughs> ancestral money and ancestral altars and things like that, and I just wanted to talk about from my point of view, and also with ancestral altars, that is more of a, I would say, African-American or hoodoo type thing, and then you go into, like, because when you think about a spiritismo, like a bovida, that's very different, that's for spirit guides, they're not necessarily for ancestors, sometimes you put ancestors on there, but it's not really for, um, ancestor ancestral altars if you are in Lukumi and Santeria they have a specific way of doing ancestral altars and if you're in that tradition you should know what that is um in Haitian voodoo there's a very specific way of dealing with ancestors and get and get a in African voodoo there's cults not just a gungun but you know there's other types of um cults that you have to be initiated into, and it's actually you have to be chosen by ancestors to do it, um, and that's how they they serve their ancestors. And Arisha, you know, obviously you have Egungun, you have Gale Day, and Egbe Orun is different; they're not necessarily ancestors. But um, each culture, especially if you initiate these traditions, you want to practice the way of dealing with your ancestors, the way the tradition is, as well as what your ancestors actually want you to do. If you have ancestors outside that culture, then obviously you may get things in Ifa or divination or Mises or whatever saying they want something outside of that because this isn't really how they they do their stuff. So, and you have to respect that. You can't just force all your ancestors into this one style of um, worship just because you decided to initiate in a tradition. So, again, it's about... It's about the relationships, about the, the give and take. It's not about everything, what you want. Um, and most people know I live on tribal reservations out in the West, in Montana, Arizona, New Mexico. So I saw a lot where they do like ancestral plates on the table. So um, there's a plate for the ancestors. So every time someone eats at the table or with the family, they will put a little bit of their plate inside the ancestral dish so that it it was like the ancestors were eating with them um, with each meal. But mind you, they're not putting pizza. They're not putting, um, you know, this is a fresh food. These are the cooked foods. These are not fast foods that they're just dropping in the ancestral plate just to bring it home. Um, hold on, come on, stop. Okay. Hola. Um, bon dia. Boa tarde. Um, I have people who speak like French and Spanish and Portuguese and Eventually, I will start doing more than just English, but um, this is just a thought that I had, so um, there we go. Talk to you guys later.